In this lecture, we're going to concentrate on Book 10, the very last book of Plato's Republic. Before we do so, however, I'd like to take one last look at the very end of Book 9, because Socrates makes a couple of remarks there that I think are worth paying attention to. And I'm referring now to lines 591e to 592b. What Socrates says there is that the job of the philosopher is to look within, to look within and see a regime, a political regime within himself. He then says that having looked within, what the philosopher will see is a pattern of a well-organized, just city. Once again, this is within the soul of the philosopher. And then, most strikingly, he says, it doesn't matter if this city that the philosopher glimpses ever actually comes into being. I think these lines are important because they remind us of a theme I've been developing in the last several lectures. The ultimate purpose of Plato's Republic may not be to actually create a blueprint for a city that could actually come into existence. Instead, what I believe the Republic is finally aiming at is precisely what Socrates has just noted at the end of Book 9. An internal city, if I can put it in those terms. The Republic is, fi is finally about the human soul. It's not a book that is devoted to the construction or even to the hope of constructing a real city on earth. I make this point with some emphasis because I'm certain that some of you in learning about Plato's Republic feel a sense of perhaps even revulsion. After all, the regime he constructs in the earlier books seems totalitarian. The family is obliterated, private property is obliterated, all interests are subordinated to the city. I'm suggesting a way of softening your reaction to the Republic, and I'm taking my bearings from these last remarks that Socrates himself makes, suggesting implicitly and nearly explicitly that the real goal of the Republic is to teach us something about ourselves and not to start a political program that we hope to put into actual practice. Now we can turn to Book 10. And this is a very surprising book. This is a book which has given scholars fits for centuries because we learn upon opening Book 10 that Socrates takes up an issue that we readers would have suspected is long finished. And the issue is poetry. You recall that a huge portion of books two and three were devoted to the censorship program, mainly focusing on the censorship of literature. Homer, Hesiod, the tragedians, the comic playwrights, they're all severely regulated in the city Socrates constructs. Having completed that, we might wonder why in the world does Socrates return to the issue of poetry at the beginning of Book 10? Let me make one point before I go any further. I want to explain this word poetry. When we use it in English, we are referring to a rather narrow genre of literature. The word poetry, as Plato would use it, is much wider in its meaning. It's interesting to look at the etymology of our own word poetry. It comes from the Greek word poiein, which, may, which means to make. Poetry, as a, a Greek would use the word, refers almost to all kinds of artistic production, artistic making in general. It certainly is not restricted to what we in English would call poetry. It refers, most importantly, to all forms of storytelling. When you tell a story, what do you do? You make it up. That little English phrase is very telling and goes right to the heart of what the word poetry means for Plato. 
Again, Socrates, as he so often does, surprises us in Book 10 because not only does he revisit the issue of poetry, but he now offers an even more severe criticism of it. If in Books 2 and 3 he censored the poets, if he regulated and restricted their creativity, in Book 10 he comes very close to banishing the poets altogether. This has become a notorious passage in the history of Western culture. It's often pointed to as the best evidence of Plato's hatred of art. We'll investigate that claim in this lecture. Socrates gives two arguments against poetry. The first is usually called by scholars the metaphysical critique of poetry. And in order to make this criticism, Socrates first reviews some of the basic elements of his famous theory of forms. I would refer you here to 596a. Socrates says the following, there is one particular form for each of the particular manys to which we apply the same name. That's a very useful line to review because it very nicely summarizes much of what we discussed about the theory of forms earlier in this course. Notice the last couple of words, the same name. Remember, as I suggested to you earlier, the theory of forms really takes its bearings, one might almost say gets its inspiration from language. We have a single word, say the word chair. That single word has a very general meaning. It refers to all the many particular chairs that exist in the world. Every single one of them is different from each other, but they're all united by being a chair. There's a one, the one chair, and then there are the many chairs. That one chair is what Socrates calls the idea of the chair or the form of the chair. Remember, those two words, idea and form, are synonyms. The next move Socrates makes is even more shocking than the fact that he is revisiting the theme of poetry. He says, there is a God, and God produced the ideas. He uses as his example the idea of the couch. Very ordinary, lowly object. I'm referring here to 597b. Now, this truly has given scholars fits because it doesn't seem to cohere with so much else that we've heard Plato say about his theory of ideas. Nowhere else in the Republic has he mentioned some sort of creative God who is able to make the ideas, make the forms. In fact, that notion of a creative God actually contradicts some of the things he says about the forms in Book 6 and Book 7. Because one important feature of the forms is that they are permanent or eternal. They do not come into being. However, if here in Book 10 we're told that God makes the ideas, then they do come into being and they're not eternal. This is a problem, a real problem, and I'll try to address it, give you some suggestion about how to think about it, at the very end of this lecture. So, first step. God makes the idea of the couch. Second step. A carpenter who imitates the idea of the couch builds a couch using wood. He builds a particular couch. Third step. A painter imitates the couch that the carpenter built and draws a painting. The key word in this discussion is imitation. Again, a very broad word. It means any form of artistic representation. From this 
metaphysical scheme, and the word metaphysical comes very close to a word we've discussed, the word ontological. A metaphysics is a conception of reality. So a metaphysical scheme is a scheme about reality. From this metaphysical scheme, God makes the idea of the couch, carpenter builds the couch, painter imitates the carpenter's couch. Socrates concludes, and now I'm referring to 598b, that imitation is very far from the truth. It's two big steps removed from the truth. The truth is found, of course, in the forms, in the ideas. The painter doesn't even have access to them. The painter's access to the form is mediated by the carpenter's couch. That's what the painter paints. Socrates expresses this by saying at 599a that imitation in general, again, artistic representation, is third from what is, third from being, and therefore is intrinsically deficient. This is the metaphysical critique of poetry, poetry understood in this very broad sense to embrace close to all forms of artistic making. Second argument that Socrates offers against poetry, and this one is more focused on poetry a bit more narrowly construed as literature, is a psychological critique. Let's use drama as our example. I believe it is what Socrates has in mind here. When you go to the theater, and the Greeks love the theater, we find on stage imitations of real people. They're in costume, they're play acting, they are in the Greek theater wearing masks, and we get involved in the events that take place on stage. These are not real events, these of course are artistic representations. These artistic representations require images, and these artistic representations generate tremendous emotional reaction in the audience. This is, of course, the heart and soul of drama. When we go to the theater, for example, we might see Sophocles' great play, Oedipus the King. We see a very good man, Oedipus, suffering terribly. He has inadvertently killed his father, married his mother through no real fault of his own. He suffers an extraordinary fate. The audience feels pity. The audience feels fear. The audience is caught up in this grand imitation, in these beautiful words, in the images that are on stage. All of this, which might sound pretty good to some people, is exactly what Socrates here is criticizing about poetry. The way he puts it is that poetry, and again, let's use drama as our example, it nourishes the irrational part of the soul. And what's that irrational part of the soul? Our desires, our emotions. It's not our reason. If we didn't have emotional reactions in the theater, the, the play we were watching, we would say, is not a good play. Remember Socrates' model of a just human being, especially in Book 4. You recall that the soul is always described as having three parts, reason, spirit, and desire. Spirit is very much an emotion. And the just human being, says Socrates, is harmonious. Reason controls desire. Spirit is the ally of reason in the control of desire. Such a human being, a good human being, according to Socrates' argument, would be very calm, very rational, very collected, exactly not like the person we see on stage. The very essence, I think, of drama is conflict. If there were no conflict that the character faced, the play simply wouldn't be interesting. 
But it's exactly conflict that Socrates has been trying to eliminate for the entirety of the Republic. First and foremost, in his constructed city, he was trying to eliminate conflict between citizens. And then when we made the transfer into the individual soul, he is trying to eliminate internal conflict. Unlike a person who is at war with himself because he can't control his own desires, the Socratic model is one of the absence of conflict, of harmony. This is, yet again, the opposite of what we see in Greek tragedy. And that's why Socrates, here in Book 10, suggests let's get rid of it. It's bad. It nourishes, it supports, it reinforces what's not the best part of us, what is in fact the lowest part of us. This same sort of critique would apply, and Socrates makes this point explicit at 606c, to comedy. Comedy in the 5th century, in the 4th century in ancient Greece, was not so different from our own versions of comedy. In any comedy that we would watch today, or an ancient Greek would watch, there'd be plenty of dirty jokes, jokes about the body, the body tends to be a very funny subject when it's ex ex displayed on stage. What happens when we go to the theater to watch a comedy, says Socrates, is that we laugh at things we would be ashamed of laughing at if we were at home alone. We laugh at things that we would never even make public in private. So comedy, Socrates is arguing here in Book 10, brings out the worst in us. And therefore, he concludes, 605b, we should not admit, not allow poets into our city. A very, very radical condemnation of poetry. The phrase Socrates uses to summarize this line of thought is found at 607b. He describes an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. The two are at war with each other. And we have had some suggestions as to why this is the case. The philosopher, and of course it's the philosopher who rules in Socrates' constructed city, the philosopher is the supremely rational human being whose desires are at service of reason. The philosopher is a soul utterly dominated by reason. Going to the theater, whether it's tragedy or comedy, threatens to disrupt that nice pattern of harmony. Let me now offer you some speculations. And here, as I've tried to do throughout this course, I must identify these as my own interpretations. This is a very mysterious chapter in Plato's Republic, Book 10, for the reasons I've already mentioned to you, and a commentator must do some speculating. There's no, there's no way out. So I will offer you some suggestions and ask you to think about them critically and perhaps even try to come up with your own. Here's the first question. Why is this critique of poetry found in Book 10 so much more severe than the censorship found in books two and three. Censorship is bad enough, but it, at least it allows some form of poetry to exist in the city. Book 10, there is none. Well, let me, let me suggest uh, an idea that comes very close to being paradoxical. I think Socrates is so critical of poetry in book 10 because he respects it so much. You might think of a relationship any one of us has to an opponent. Think, for example, if you're an athlete. If you're an athlete, you develop a very complicated relationship to your opponent, especially if you have an opponent who really challenges you. If you're a tennis player and you're much, much better than your opponent, you can defeat her easily, that's not a very interesting game. If, by contrast, your opponent is 
as good as you are, or perhaps even a little better. It's a terrific match. Maybe you win, maybe you lose. But at the end of the day, you know you've been pushed so hard by your opponent. And, and, and as a result, you have a respect and an affection even for your opponent. Even though you just spent such a grueling couple of hours trying to defeat her. I would suggest that something like this is going on in Socrates' relationship to poetry. It is his opponent. He is critical of it. But at the same time, he acknowledges its immense power, its immense role that it plays in human culture. Another way to put this point is that he acknowledges that poetry is a fundamental human option. It's a fundamental alternative to philosophy. And it can't simply be refuted. It, it, it won't disappear. No one is going to read the arguments in Book 10 of the Republic and then say, OK, I'll never write any more poetry. I won't go to any more plays. That sort of artistic production has such a pull on us, we'll never let it go. I think Plato understands this very well. Now, let me suggest you read 607C with some care, because it's another one of these rather surprising lines that we so often find in the Republic. He says that if there could be an argument that a poet could make to defend his poetry, then in fact we would be delighted to receive it into the city. I would describe that line as a door opener. It opens the door to the possibility of what I would describe as a philosophical form of poetry. If a kind of poetry could emerge which could explain itself, justify itself, articulate itself philosophically, then it would be acceptable in the very city which just a few lines earlier had banished the poets. Let me make a radical suggestion, one that you should take with a grain of salt. I would suggest that the Platonic dialogues themselves, the Republic in particular, is exactly this, a philosophical form of poetry. Let's just take a step back and think about the Republic in rather commonsensical terms. What do we discover? Well, we discover, first of all, it's a lot like a drama. There are plenty of characters, and the author of this drama, Plato, imitates them. When you're reading book one, you meet this old man, Cephalus, and then you meet this younger man, Polymarchus, and then we meet this extremely hot-headed man, Thrasymachus. These are all very lifelike characters, and you, as a reader, are caught up in the drama of Socrates trying to refute them. Well, this is very peculiar, because what we're discovering is that Plato himself violates his own strictures against poetry in the Republic itself. I think he's playing a little trick on us, us the readers. He's criticizing poetry, but he's actually writing a poem. Again, remember, poem is a much broader word than we typically take it to be. He's writing a poem in which one of the characters, Socrates, criticizes poetry. Let me give another example of how Plato plays this trick on us. And here I'll go back a little bit to book two. If you recall, the storylines of all literature are severely censored in book two and, and in book three. And one of the prohibitions that Socrates insists upon is that we're not going to have stories in which just men are unhappy and unjust men are happy. That's a very dangerous story because we would, we, we would use it to discourage people from being just. If we tell stories in which just people come to bad endings, then we might have a deleterious effect 
on our citizens. That was the rationale in book two. But let's never forget the story, and that is what it is, that actually sparks the entire republic. And that's the story Glaucon tells about the ring of Gyges. And here we have a man who steals a ring, uses it to become invisible, sleeps with the queen, kills the king. He is not a just man, and he seems to flourish. Now, that's a story that Glaucon tells in order to provoke Socrates to refute it. Nonetheless, Glaucon tells a story which would itself be prohibited in the city that Socrates constructs. Another example of the sort of trick I think Plato is playing on us. He is trying to show us implicitly that while, yes, poetry is to be criticized, at the same time, it's not actually to be completely banished. It's actually present in the Republic itself. In this regard, let me make a comparison between Socrates' attitude towards poetry and his attitude towards sophistry. Remember, Thrasymachus is a sophist. He is a relativist. He practices the art of rhetoric. In many dialogues, Socrates draws a comparison between the sophist and the poet. Recall that the relativist denies that there is any absolute truth and instead insists that all truth, all values are relative to a particular context or social group. In this country, freedom of speech is counted to be a good thing. In that country, it's counted to be a bad thing. Freedom of speech is neither good nor bad. It depends who holds the view. Rhetoric plays such an important role in the relativistic world of the sophist because it's by means of rhetoric that any given value, any given truth, comes into being. If I can manage to persuade the citizens of my city to believe that freedom of speech is a good thing, then freedom of speech will be counted as a good thing. It's not absolutely good. It's not objectively good. It's good in my city. Why is it good? Because I made it good. I constructed a view, and I persuaded other people to buy into my view. I use the word make deliberately to draw the connection between sophistry and poetry. Both of them imply that human beings don't see the truth, they make the truth. Or more accurately, they make lots and lots and lots of truths. I would suggest that Plato has a very similar attitude to sophistry and to poetry. He's very critical of both. Neither is as good as philosophy. But he understands that both are extremely powerful opponents. They are both representative of fundamental human options. And Plato understands very well that they cannot simply disappear. So, when it comes to sophistry, we certainly have learned that Socrates is not averse to using rhetoric. He borrows the tricks that the sophist himself would use, and so he defeats Thrasymachus in book one. And we, of course, know that Socrates is really not averse to using the tools of the poet. Repeatedly, we've seen him tell stories. We've seen him construct images. I suggested in earlier lectures that books eight and nine really constitute the story of regime change. Not a logical argument, not a historical analysis, but a story. So Socrates himself, while criticizing both of his opponents, nonetheless respects both very highly. I'm finally able to make a very brief suggestion about why Socrates introduces what is, in fact, a bizarre idea, given the rest of the Republic, and that is that there is a creative God who creates the forms. Perhaps you can guess what my suggestion is. What he is underlining 
is the worldview, the view that both the sophists and the poets hold. It's the view that reality is made. Reality is not seen. Seeing is what the philosopher does. The philosopher sees the truth. The sophist makes up persuasive arguments. The poet makes up stories. The enormous emphasis on making in this section, I think, is encapsulated with this otherwise bizarre idea that God himself is created, an idea we do not find anywhere else in the Republic.